Hello, everybody, and welcome to Club Moffat Talks. I am Joseph, and I am an instructional librarian here at Moffat Library. And I'm Ryan Samuelson. I am the Associate University Librarian for Public Services. And we have a guest today. Would you like to tell us uh, your name and a little bit about what you do on campus? Yes. Hi. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. My name is um, Lee Gajem. I'm Dr. Gajem. I'm the Assistant Professor of German at MSU Texas. And we're very, very glad to have you with us today. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, you know what I didn't do, and I should have done this, is I, I did not bring up the outline of the order in which things are supposed to happen. Oh. Yeah. It's like I, I made sure that I brought up the, the list of things to talk about that are going on around town okay. at the end, yeah. but I did not bring up the outline. I think well, what we're supposed to do now, though, is talk about what we've been up to recently, what we've I, been reading. I have about. it right in front of me. Number one, greetings and introductions, yes. which we did. Yes. First of ourselves and then of our, of, of our guest. Yes. And number two, it says this week. Yes. What is happening in, in, on the campus and the community now and what we are reading, watching, playing, doing, whatever we want to talk about that we're, that's engaged in right now. Okay, that's what that's what we're going to go to. So, uh, Lee, uh, when you're not working, uh, what have you been reading, watching, playing recently? Well, what I've been watching, I watch K-drama in order to maintain my Korean language. Mm. So that's pretty much what I do if I don't work. And what I read, um, currently I'm reading, actually I have it here because uh, I'm continuing to read this. It's my um, next research uh, oh. that I'll be presenting next week at, in Kentucky. And it's, uh, of course, another manga. Oh, nice. <laughs> And I pretty much it connects with my research. So uh, research and teaching as well as I, I guess pleasurable reading. Mm. It's uh, reading manga and then just looking for what is a, is there a German connection or is there anything as in like a trans transcultural product? That's mm. what I'm searching for. But also it's also my leisure all the time. And yeah, anything else that I do if I don't work or if I don't research, that's pretty much it. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Uh, Ryan, are, are you still pretending that you don't have a life or do you actually, you know? No, I started watching stuff again. Um, a lot of the stuff I was doing earlier is over with now. So I, I've got free time finally again. Um, I've been watching the third and possibly final season of Ted Lasso. It's a very good show for those who haven't seen it. And I was greatly happy at the fact that, um, so this morning, it was announced the second season of Star Wars Visions. If you don't know what Star Wars Visions is, mm -hmm. uh, DC has done something remarkable. They basically opened up uh, their the Star Wars catalog or the Star Wars universe to their competitors, for the most part, other oh, wow. people in animation. And they basically say, do whatever you want. Have uh, have fun. Play around with it. Do a story that you think is interesting or 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 something you want to do to show off what you guys do. And they did it um, They did it two years ago with a bunch of uh, Japanese um, animation studios. This year they're doing South Korea and France and Chile and Spain and, and the United States and South Africa. And, and it, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm really looking forward to the fact. And it, it is remarkable that Disney would go out there and say, hey, competitors, have, come play in our, our, our sandbox. Come play in our little universe and show off what you can do. I find that really remarkable, and I find that very unique in today's world. You know, sure. they're also very. Oh, I would say they're great stories, but the thing is, they're they're short. They're little. They're little. They're little you know, twenty thirty minute little um, animations that they do. And mm -hmm. if you don't like one, you can move on to the next, and you might like the next one. So it, it, I really, I'm looking forward to this. To the to um, May May fourth is when the when the when the new series is going to premiere the new season of, of of Star Star Wars Visions and as someone who's kind of dropped off Star Wars I don't I don't really watch any more Star Wars anymore this mm -hmm. is something I will be watching because it's it's fun to see different studios different takes on things different stories different people getting to play around with with fun things yeah uh. 
I last month I had mentioned that there were several movies coming out in March that I was interested in, and I've actually been able to see three of them. Oh. I saw the uh, Dungeons and Dragons movie, the new Shazam, and the new John Wick. Of those three, honestly, my favorite was the Dungeons and Dragons movie. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, I did not get done all of the reading that I had hoped to get done. Um, I, I finished the uh, Magicians trilogy, um, and uh, I read the Grimm's manga, which you're familiar with. Yeah. Uh, and I've been working on finishing the Witcher series, but I, I still have a, a book to go to, to finish that off. I picked up a couple of books through interlibrary loan that I just decided to add to my pile of stuff that I still haven't read yet. But um, I found a book that I thought sounded really interesting. And uh, I don't know the author's name off the top of my head, but it's called Say This, Not That. And it's a book about effective communication. And I thought that that might be an appropriate book for me to read. Uh, the other thing that I picked up was I got a collection of Elmore, Elmore Leonard short stories, including the story that the movie 310 to Yuma was based on. Uh, in the last couple of months, I've watched both of the versions of 310 to Yuma, the one that was from like the 50s with Glenn Ford and the more recent one with uh, Russell Crowe, and they're different. Uh, substantially different enough that I was like, what is the actual story? Is either of these movies close to what the story was? So I, I haven't read it yet, but it's also sitting on my pile of books to read. Uh, but yeah, that's 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 it for me. Okay. Well, All looking right. at our at our at our schedule, uh, we're now supposed to have a, a guest and or Q and A. We have a guest. <laughs> yes. So we're supposed to um, introduce a primary topic or discuss, analyze, and answer as thoroughly as possible in the time allowed various different questions is what you have in your notes. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, Lee, <laughs> what would you like to talk about today? Did you want to talk about the Grimm's manga or did, is there other stuff that you would like to talk about today? No, we can definitely talk about Grimm's manga, especially because you took the time to actually uh, order it through Interlibrary Loan and actually read it. So let's talk about that. And that's my recent article as well, too. So I thought that would be an appropriate topic to talk about. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, can you tell us about what made you decide to, to do that um, as, as, a, as a subject? Mm -hmm. Well, it started off, well, Grimm's manga, there's uh, basically my two passion coming together, mm -hmm. uh, fairy tales. And um, of course, you know, with my uh, background, with my literary background of German, I have various collection of um, uh, Grimm's fairy tale. Of course, they're all in German. Mm -hmm. And I began with this um, just because out of, you know, passion for what I like to read, but also because it's my research background with the 19th century. Hmm. And just the literary movement that I was interested in, in romanticism mm -hmm. and the notion of fairy tale and how everything has been Disneyfied. So all the different reading mm -hmm. Grimm's manga and growing up, um, Grimm's, excuse me, Grimm's fairy tale, growing up with Grimm's fairy tale in Germany and then being exposed to in the States and even before that with the Disney version. So there was this kind of a conflict as well. So I always wanted to write about it. And then um, my favorite thing pretty much to do is to read manga. That's another thing that I grew up with besides reading the Grimm's fairy tale. So those two that of my interest that I like to do from childhood as well as, you know, well into adulthood came together. So when I saw this um, manga and it says Grimm's manga, it of course caught the interest because there's Grimm and there's manga and there's a fusion. So is there a fusion? What What is their interconnection? So it got me really curious. And that's, um, yeah, when I picked up the book, I was like, and I read it and I was like, wait a minute. Of course, you know, at, first of all, you have to understand too, it was, it's, it's in German. It was published for the German publisher, but the artist, Kei Shiyama, she's actually Japanese and she wrote it in, uh, in Japanese, but it was translated, but immediately into German because it was for the German uh, publisher. Mm -hmm. So reading it, I thought, what can, what else can I do with this besides, of course, write about it? <laughs> that was the next thing. 
So that's how it came about. So yeah, coming go, going from the, you know growing up with the Grimm's fairy tale, and then you know growing up also with the manga, and then them that both of this my interests come into one. That was just just a beauty. I had to do something with it. <laughs> were were there any were there any uh, artistic choices or uh, mm -hmm. story choices that surprised you? Uh, the, I, I appreciate the visual language. Mm -hmm. So uh, the manga version, it's really geared to young female adults. That that was one thing. Um, my interest that, and I uh, talked about this in my um, in my article as well, is Rapunzel. Rapunzel has been made into, uh, rather than a damsel in distress, Rapunzel is actually a male. So there's kind of an androgynous male that's very beautiful, very slender. And uh, and this Rapunzel wasn't necessarily a damsel in distress. In fact, he or you know I think the identified gender that I would assign to his performance would be a male. His performance was a male, but his appearance was a female. So this is kind of a play of gender in a sense. It's, I wouldn't say genderless, but not gender specific. The performing act, which I use queer theory to analyze, was very appropriate because of the performance the, the Rapunzel represented, but also performed. And then you have also the the female hero, what necessarily wasn't a female hero, but she fulfilled that kind of a role of a, um, of a hero. So therefore, this female was assigned as a role of a male. So there's this kind of a play, but the fluidity and gender of the choices that they made as well as their performance. So that visually displaying the the beautiful slender Rapunzel in a male version with long hair it, gorgeously drawn to draw uh, to draw attention to the, the the outer appearance but the performing that Rapunzel has done or does in the manga version is both it's this kind of a you know you can also be beautiful but as well as be the hero but that doesn't necessarily mean that you are in, in need of um to be rescued Right. It's very interesting this kind of interplay. So I, and the visual really is, is striking because as you you know what was that kind of a what you would imagine a Rapunzel would be a beautiful with long hair, but then in a male version and that's appropriately and that was well displayed. Yeah. Uh, were were there any elements that uh, that you didn't care for that you felt like didn't work for you? Um, I wouldn't necessarily the elements. No, not in Rapunzel. Maybe some other manga, but I don't really go into into detail about that one. But mm -hmm. yes, okay. I have to think about that. Yeah. All right. Um. Did you? You, uh, because you're the German professor, and yes. you you did so you read you read the manga in German. Yes. Okay. Um, did you did you feel like that because you're familiar with the with the uh, with the original fairy tales? Did yes. you feel like did you feel like it translated well? Oh, um, most definitely. I have to say they did a very well. Kei Shama, what she also did is um, she researched what you know because she had to cater to the German audience mm -hmm. because it was made for German audience. She had to kind of research, is this appropriate? Will there be, uh, you know, backlashes? Will there be resistance because it is now uh, an androgynous Rapunzel? Mm -hmm. uh, because Rapunzel is not, a, you know, a female, it's a male. And how would that come across? Will that be a point where the German audience would resist this? And I, don't, I think she did an amazing job just because she stayed true to the story. Because Rapunzel does perform the, the male... Uh, performance in the fact that Rapunzel impregnates uh, the the counterpart, his um, the female hero that rescues him, but they both, in a sense, rescue each other and help each other. They support each other. There's this kind of a common community communication going where they really work together, and I think that's uh, well done. Even though yes, and she did stay true to the original story. And the female hero gets pregnant and has twins, just like in Grimm's fairy tale. So it was rather interesting to have students in my class read it. So this class that I'm teaching currently is called the Grimmers of them all. It's an honor course and it's taught in English. 
And my students had to read the Rapunzel um, manga part. It's a chapter. Uh, it's not very long, so it was rather easily read. The challenge that my students had was rather the, the reading um, direction because it goes from right to left. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so that was a kind of a visual challenge for them to follow the story. But they thought it was very well illustrated in a sense that they would have never imagined Rapunzel being a, a, a male. Because the way it was drawn and the way it kind of led up, they all expected, of course, Rapunzel to be female. So there was there were this element of surprise. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I guess they did not expect it to be very true to the Grimm's fairy tale story because we read that first before we read the Grimm's manga. So they kind of had to look into what is the what is actually the role? What is the Rapunzel's role to fulfill in the manga version versus the Grimm's version? And what is the moral of the story? And I found it interesting that um, some students did conclude, well, regardless of what happens in the tower, male and female, they will <laughs> um, end up what they're doing in the Grimm's Fairy Tale as well. So it was kind of interesting, funny, but we were really focusing on the core theory and the performance of their different genders. Have you um, thought about maybe doing, expanding on this? I know that... Um... Uh, I was I was sent in your direction a couple times because of you're one of the few people here on campus that's doing something with with manga and graphic novels and stuff like that. Would you think about doing something like that again in the future, or maybe expanding to other graphic novels? Oh, most definitely. We did teach a class. Uh, in fact, um, Dr. Lynch, the French professor, and I taught a, a graphic novel course, and um, that was right after pandemic. So it didn't. It didn't, well, I think there was a lack of advertisement on our part as well, just because it was something new. And that was, I had a lot of fun because that's that's my thing. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. what I researched. Uh, they had to read Scott McCloud. He kind of, uh, he, he writes comics about comics, which was really interesting. So yes, I would love to expand that. Well, I love Scott McCloud. I especially love how he talks about the difference between Eastern and Western comics for those who aren't used to reading Eastern um, the Eastern style, he really breaks down the stylistic choices between the two of them. Yeah. And the use of, of of timing is much different in Eastern manga than it is in, in Western comics. Yes, it's very long winded. And I like the way he explains it. Very, It's, it's, it's very visual how that he explains it. Mm -hmm. And even the whole story. And of course, I appreciate the fact that he gives credit to the modern comic, to a, a, a Swiss um Töpfe. I, I appreciate that and he's not German but he's Swiss so <laughs> I kind of claim that ground as well so it's and then he all of course talks about Osamu Tetsuka he's like the godfather yeah. of manga and how Osamu Tetsuka also had some influence of from Britain British comic as well as French comic hmm. I, I really appreciate how Scott McCloud covers really a wide range oh, I mean he goes all the way back to the Egyptians saying the the Egyptian tombs are all comics. I mean, yes. essentially. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I. It in my graduate school, I did a course on on graphic novels, and we used the Scott McCloud books to, uh, as part at part of our textbooks, and then read a variety of styles of of graphic novels, um, because we did. Uh, we did One Piece and Fruits Basket and Dark Knight Returns um, and Mouse. Oh, yeah. So we did se several different ones. Uh, yeah, I have Fruit Basket actually in Korean as well. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> now, of course, I have Mouse as well, but um, the the... I guess my privilege as well as being a researcher as well is to get to meet some artists. Mm -hmm. So I read this, um, I actually met this artist and she's American. He's on New Living. I met oh. her and this graphic novel talks about the school system. So there's no Ivy oh. League. Um, and we got into conversation. She and I had this conversation about school system because in Germany, public, um, in Germany, there are uh, you can't homeschool so because of the notion of no ivy league of the whole school system and we were talking about the fact that they didn't have they're not allowed to homeschool so we don't have that it's actually legal so that was another thing and then you mentioned mouse of course mouse i have both for them yes and 
if I think about Scott McLeod, but I also have to mention Will Eisner. Will Eisner yeah. really does a, a phenomenal uh, explanation and job explaining what graphic novel per se is. Mm -hmm. So uh, for me, Scott McLeod is kind of like overall, but also more, more comic. And then Will Eisner really breaks it down and kind of like separates what is the difference. Um, there's definitely a huge difference between comic and um graphic novel and now we have manga we have manhua which is the korean one but the latest one that i'm really interested i do have to say i did i didn't get to mention is webtoon oh. i don't know if you ever have webtoon so there's web comic but there's webtoon and webtoon is from korea oh. so and my students actually um in the grims the grims of them all i had to read a chapter in webtoon mm -hmm. so the webtoons are designed for head uh, cell phones and you scroll up, oh. you read from, you know, left to right, you know, because Korean manhwa is reading the direction. It's just like in the Western style. But the webtoon itself, you scroll up to continue. So I told them, you only reading one chapter and I'm scrolling up <laughs> and up. <laughs> I'm like, it's just one chapter and I'm still scrolling. <laughs> so the whole joke was like, okay, Dr. Gage, we're, we're still scrolling and it's only a chapter. Um, so that was quite interesting. But yes, there's different fairy tale adaptation as well too in the webtoon. So they had to read just one chapter of the kind of like a newly made uh, Cinderella version. So huh. that's another room that I haven't explored. But they they found the webtoon easier to navigate because mm -hmm. it's still the reading directions from left to right. They just have to go up and hopefully continue to go up till the end of the first chapter. And that's one of the things I love about um graphic novels, manga, comics nowadays, is is someone who's been reading them for 50 years now. Yeah. It's amazing how international it is. You'll have it's it because we can do things like like we're doing right now, a uh, Skype, they can do business across large chunks of, of 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 the planet, basically. You can have the writer could be on on one hemisphere and the the artist could be on a second hemisphere type of thing. That happens a lot. There's a lot more, I think, collaboration across um, nationalities. And and the fact that people read all sorts of different uh, national uh, uh, comics nowadays. Back in the days, you wouldn't have, uh, believe me, you didn't have exposure to overseas comics or overseas manga. I really love the fact that it is, you know, it is one of the things the internet has brought about is the fact that, uh, and, and the way the world is nowadays, is you have access to the entire realm of, of stories from across all different cultures and all different perspectives. I have to say, um, I was I was worried that some of the elements, cultural elements would be lost in translation, but thus far they have done well to preserve it. They do have- well, What's interesting is somebody who, you know, kept, who's, I've done, Got a, did lectures here 20 years ago on the nature of comics and stuff like that. Even back then, Japanese manga was well overtaking um, Western comics as far as popularity in this country. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that's still true, but it was 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Naruto was far more popular than the Avengers. Uh, yeah. It probably still is that way, honestly. I have I have to confess too, um, when I was growing up in Germany, I thought Donald Duck and Mickey Mouse were uh, German. I did not know that they were uh, American. Um, and I have a reason, I have actually a valid reason for it too. See, I grew up with this, this is a comic book mm -hmm. with Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck. And this is of course dedicated to Donald Duck because he's my favorite. Uh, I prefer Donald Duck over Mickey Mouse. And these are books and in color. Oh, yeah. Yes, and now even to this year, two thousand twenty-three, it started in two thousand twenty. I think they two of these come out every month, and these have how many pages? About two hundred and about three hundred pages. This is what I grew up, and we had magazines as well too, magazines. But these are books that we collected. Oh yeah, and that's that's because the um the main writer for at least Donald Duck was a guy called Carl Barks. And he was far more popular in Europe than he ever was in the United States, honestly. Yeah. So when somebody told me Mickey Mouse was American, I was like, no, he's not. Donald Duck. So they asked me, how does Donald Duck, you know, speak German? I'm like, well, like he does in English. Like, quack, quack, quack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, uh, again, it's well known that for years, the, the Disney uh, comics 
were far far more popular in Europe than they were in the United States, actually. So that doesn't seem unusual to me at all. Yeah. Hmm. But this whole debate about that, that Donald Duck and Mickey Mouse is American was very interesting. Our class was split. So half of the class loved Donald Duck and the other, you know, like Mickey Mouse. I, of course, I was a fan of Donald Duck and I am in that side. Yeah. I I don't have a preference between them. <laughs> I, so I, I I I I would want to go for the third choice, you know. I'm just like oh, you gotta go Donald Duck. He's got so much more there. Uncle Scrooge opened up a whole world of 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 canon. There there's so much more on the on the Donald Duck side than there is the Mickey Mouse side. The Mickey Mouse was cute little stories. The Donald Duck is is friggin' epics. Go read the. The uh, what was it? The history of the of, of of Uncle Scrooge or something. I forget the name of it, but it's 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 an epic long. I would say it's a graphic novel. He wrote a graphic. Yeah. Uh, Carl Barks wrote a graphic novel about about how Uncle Scrooge became Uncle Scrooge, and it's it's a long, long volumes upon volumes of this epic story of of rags to riches that um, most people in this country know know nothing about, but most people in Europe have read it as kids. Actually, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, we know about his dime that he earned, as well as his name. All the names are so different. Donald Duck is the only one that, and Mickey Mouse have this. Minnie Mouse has the same, and I don't remember Daisy Duck's in German name. But the the nephews, Huey, Dewey, Louie, it's tick, click, and tuck. <laughs> and Dagobad Duck, it, 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 Duck, and uh, you said Scrooge McDuck. Yeah, Scrooge. Yeah, Dagobad Duck. And Daniel Dusentrieb. Daniel is the uh, he's the inventor. Yeah, that helps. Yeah. And Panzerknacker, Panzerknacker are those um the 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 robbers that try mm -hmm. to rob Beagle Boys and Gizmo, yeah. Yeah, and, see Panzerknacker. So all these different names, it's quite interesting to hear them. And it's the same way uh, in, in Sweden and 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 Norway. They also are very popular in those countries as well. And again, they have different names as well. Yes. But the Huey Dewey lawyer really threw me off. I'm like, no, 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 no. That tick, tick, and fuck. It just flows. Da, 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 da. Tick, tick, and fuck. Uh, for another thing that I was doing many years ago, I was doing research in the um, on the the book uh, Alice in Wonderland oh. uh, and Through the Looking Glass uh, by Lewis Carroll, and I was reading behind the scenes information about the the stories and one of the things that it talked about was when the stories are translated to another language they would have to rewrite the nonsense words to make sure that they continued to be nonsense words uh and and still flowed with the 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 rhythm of the poetry um but yeah and i thought that that was interesting because i i had tunnel vision about it so i didn't think about that something that i would consider to be a nonsense word could be a normal word in another language and i i didn't think about it but when i read that i was like that completely makes sense you know that that you would have to create new nonsense words well that's going to be one of the hardest things when translating manga or anime to english is what do you do about the puns because there's usually yeah. tons of puns in various stories or you know someone's name is similar to another word and it's getting mixed up or something along those lines yeah yeah it's a really good i point. like what some people did they said just just go with the the japanese or the korean version of the name and just let the the english readers figure it out yeah because yeah. Technically, those readers or viewers would have enough knowledge in order to identify those too. Because, but I'm thinking about the fact Alice in Wonderland. I've never read it in German. Mm. I only read it later, actually, part of my research because it's kind of like an anti fairy tale. Mm. So I can't even think about how they would actually translate those nonsense words. Yeah. But going on the anime and manga, um. I don't know if you guys know uh, Attack on Titan. It was one of the very popular manga mm -hmm. made into anime. Of course, I oh, I like to refer to that because it has German. You know, it's anything that kind of like connects to German. Um, Jaeger Hunter. 
that mm -hmm. his uh, Aaron uh, uh, Eagle. And also the anime, if you ever watched it, uh, uh, the beginning part of the opening part is mm -hmm. in German. Because they start singing, yeah, sind wir das Essen? Nein, wir sind die Jäger. And then just because yeah. a student asked me, like, is that really German? Like, yes. And um, yeah. And I talk about that when I I was invited to the Red Talk at the Honors uh, College. Mm -hmm. And I was I mentioned that too. I showed him a little clip. And yes, that's very German. It's a German song that they started with. So it's quite interesting. Yeah, it's interesting how there are a number of, of connections between at least Japan and Germany. Well, okay. Yeah. If you go back to World War II, there's a big connection you're skipping over, Ryan. <laughs> but um, it's interesting that um, a lot of manga artists um, have spent time in Germany, uh, yeah. or at least, you know, have visited Germany or, or or are familiar with it and stuff. I know that Miyazaki spent time in Germany and fell in love with it. I know that um, uh, one of my favorite um, mangas of all time is is Monster, and that's oh. set entirely in German, in, in, yes. in Germany. So Monster. I just I find it's interesting. See, I'm getting all excited because in Monster in the manga itself, they mentioned my hometown, Wiesbaden. I'm like, oh, oh. <laughs> what do you? Because it, it's, I mean, Wiesbaden is not a small town, a small city. It's right next to Frankfurt, but I've never seen it in a in a manga until I'm like, oh, they actually mentioned. I, I have a screenshot of it because <laughs> <laughs> I read it online. I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna have I'm gonna have to take a picture of this because this is really cool because it's my hometown. Yeah. So I, I just find that interesting that that that, that there, there seem to be these these connections between Germany. I mean, a lot of people think Germany and, and, and manga, but yeah, yeah, there actually is. Um, we have, where's my other book? But there's a whole research book. Uh, it's called Germ Manga, Germany and Manga, Germ Manga. So I thought that was kind of catchy. Mm -hmm. And also because um, during the turn of the century, I, I don't quote me on the exact time, but Japan was fascinated with anything German. So the whole education system that Bismarck actually, you know, the Iron Chamber mm -hmm. kind of like uh, initiated, they were fascinated with their education system. They kind of mimicked that too, which was interesting. And anything German, you know, even German music. If you think about um, Miyazaki, um, Ponyo. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys ever seen Ponyo, the mm -hmm. little mermaid. Her name is Hildegard. That's a German name. Uh, and uh, okay, you know, the mermaid was from Hans Christian Andersen, but you know, just the, the German and the music too. So um, what else was there? That, that and there's so many different connections with, with the German. And there were a lot of delegates sent to Germany during that time too, just to understand and uh, learn about the German education system that they brought back to, the, to Japan. And Japan during the occupation in Korea, Korea took part of that. So Korea kind of like, you know, uh, got a lot of the German German fairy tales from actually Japanese. And um, Japan actually had the translation because they didn't have access to the language. They had the British version. So it was translated from German to, to English and then from English to Japan, uh, Japanese and then Japanese to Korean. It, it just, and then um, even the, one of the biggest work from uh, Goethe was translated from Japanese actually from, you know, to Korean. And finally, it was just not too recently, like 1950s, 40s, they finally translated from German to Korean, finally from the original to the Korean language. So it just went all around. It, it, it's fascinating. Um, in fact, speaking of education, Korea, since 2020, initiated this what they call this vocational school that they got from Germany called Meister, uh, Meister Schule, the master school. So it's really vocational school, similar geared towards what Germany had established. So you're learning from a, a apprenticeship. You're learning from a master who was, you know, skilled in that craft rather than going to college. So there's another alternative. Mm -hmm. And since it's been actually started a long time ago in Germany, uh, in Korea, but in 2020, they actually kind of revamped it because they noticed that the pressure of going to college, it, it, it's, yeah, it's very different in, in Korea. So it kind of lessened that and given uh, students more better opportunity or even more opportunity to study in a vocational school rather than going to college. And it's a very, it's, it's pretty much what they copied from Korea, uh, from Germany to Korea, hence the name of Meister Schule. It's German. There's some German names that they just took over. So it's it's quite interesting when I hear Korean. I'm like, wait, is that Korean or is that German? I have to think about it. Well, it's not that unusual in English because we have, you can learn about um, folk uh, folk tales in kindergarten here. Yeah. So 
So oh, that was an epic opener for my students. They're like, kindergarten means a garden of children. Wow. It's like, <laughs> it's German too. So, yeah. I didn't even think about it that they would not know because that's just. Normal. It's just a word, you know. Yeah. yeah. It's something that we just know. Um, it, things like that, it, it just doesn't dawn on me. Like, you know, uh, zeitgeist. They, they actually. Oh, yeah, zeitgeist, yeah. Yeah, and that's German. And of course it's German. It's tight, guys. <laughs> it's like, is there a translation for it? I'm like, yeah. Yes. I'm in spirit. I mean, spirit yeah. of the times. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, aside from the manga that I know that you have an, an yeah. interest in anyway, uh, and not counting uh, Disney, are there, are there, uh, other uh retellings of the Grimm's tales that uh that you enjoy that you you can point at and go that's a good version mm, that's a good question it depends i guess what you're interested in i i have to say um because <laughs> i'm a huge fan of netflix <laughs> only because my son i only converse with him in german so there is a what is it called now it's kind of like a grim retelling for children. They have some cruel elements in it. Mm -hmm. And I can't think of the name right now. It's um, And they did a, uh, from the book, they actually did a Netflix version of it. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to have to look it up and try to figure out because it's, and they did a really, they did a decent job, I should say. They mm -hmm. include diversity. That's one thing that they have included. Inclusion and diversity is kind of part of this kind of a new retelling. And it's geared towards children with the cruelty some of the cruelty not all of the cruelty uh from the grimm's fairy tale hmm. so i thought they did a really good job started with the book and then it, and it's an uh, american version it's I actually i think an american author i have to look it up and i can't think of it right now but that's a really i would say it's good for children so i'm not sure adults my students actually had to watch a series that, um they thought it was quite interesting because it, it stayed very true to we watched hansel and gretel we watched hansel and gretel of the uh, netflix version of it and it stayed as close to the truth that was the cruelty of and the cannibal cannibalism mm -hmm. um, of course they didn't see the the graphic part of it they kind of like um covered that up in a sense so they did a pretty decent job yeah so oh, I'm going to have to look that up right now. So, oh. well, Because I'm a librarian, I've actually have gone to the Wikipedia page for Hansel and Gretel. Huh? And there have been 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 different films based uh, called Hansel and Gretel. Um, it's a series. It's a um, series. Which one is it called? It's for kids. Hmm. Yes. Oh, The Dark Tale. The Dark Tale of Grimm. Okay. Uh, wow, Tim Burton directed a television special for Hansel and Gretel back in 1983. I had no idea. I like the there's a Korean horror movie uh, version of the Grimm's Fairy Tale of the Hansel and Gretel that I like to watch. But uh, I tried to convince my students they had a choice. They they chose the other Gr uh, Hansel and Gretel version. So there's several one. Um, mm -hmm. But I do want to watch the one with the Korean version because it it has this kind of a horror element. Mm -hmm. So uh, and the, and the children and the kind of eeriness of the children, how they sing the songs. So yeah, that's something that I would also recommend. And so, and yeah, it's two thousand seven. Yeah. Yeah. But I like the Netflix version for my son especially because you know I I did want him to know the Grimm's fairy tale the cruelty of it but not in that to the extreme <laughs> you tell him yeah that's true. a lot of people think that you know oh it's Grimm's fairy tales they're they're children's stories and they are children's stories but they're if you've ever read the originals I mean the, the the ones before basically the brothers Grimm were told by the publisher you know you might want to cut some of this stuff out it's dark it's dark yeah. dark dark um Parking Grim, yeah, a tale dark and grim. That's the actually. Um, it was first. Uh, what is it called? A book. Uh, a tale dark and grim. That's actually it's it's for it's for children, but I think it's actually more like for young adults, mm -hmm. and it's 
book version is really good. And then the Netflix version, they did a phenomenal job of trying to be more inclusive and include diversity. So that's something that I would definitely say. And But the, yeah, Hansel and Gretel, the, the Korean horror version. Yeah. But I also like, you know, what is it called? The Mirror Mirror? Oh, uh-huh. Yeah. The Mirror Mirror. I, I like that one as well, too. Only because, of course, who was the uh, one of the star? Uh, Julia Roberts. And, yes, uh, only because I like Julia Roberts. And uh, it's a what, different, yeah, different yeah. spin on. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, they they had the, and it's just a thing that happens is where they have two different movies come out at about the same time that are based on the same source material because the Mirror Mirror came out at about the same time as uh, the Snow White and the Huntsman movie. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, and of course, those, those, are, those are different movies. You know. There was a Red Riding Hood movie in 2011. I, really, I, I like that one only because it was, um, it was definitely different, but very close to the Grimm version because there are two wolves. Hmm. Uh, also, what was the other thing? I think that was, yeah, it, it was definitely, um, I didn't expect it the way it actually turned out. So that was something that, yeah, I was, it, it was unexpected, um, and definitely worth my time watching it, even though it, it had some romantic elements. We were like, okay, you know, that, that, you know, we can leave that out, but the storytelling actually they did a decent job. One of the strangest one I remember seeing was, uh, uh, in the company of wolves, hmm. you guys ever seen that one? It's it's strange. It's a strange version of uh, Grimm's fairy tales, but specifically a Little Red Riding Hood. But it's it's very very surreal, I guess. Uh -huh. Okay, I have to pick on Red Riding Hood because originally it's of course French and just different morality and moral to the story. <laughs> And, and the way the Grimm's wrote it was for their time. So they used some words that would be um, read out of context, I guess. They you call her a little dinde, um, which is, a, it has two meanings, means a little girl, but also uh, later on, not during the time that Grimm wrote it, but then it changed, meaning prostitute. So like, okay, now you you really reading it differently because we read it in a different class in a different course and it was in German. So the students looked up Dienda. They're like, wait a minute, <laughs> this, this is a prostitute in Eliza. It was a whole new reading for that too. And um, also interesting is just the notion, see, this is when you reading it with a different translation or um different understanding and then the wolf asks what do you have under your apron so in those times for the grim tales under your apron is where your pocket was and where you stored all your stuff so it sounded very interesting when a student read it saying okay a little prostitute is walking down the dark you know wood and then this wolf is asking what do you have under your apron so all this was a quite interesting read for the student for the first time so i've no from then on i noticed that i need to give them the actual translation too sometimes so they don't look up the word and it has because of the meaning changing mm -hmm. that they don't read it differently than it was intended i think that's the best way to describe it yeah very interesting read Good experience for me to know what words to translate and what to give away to know for sure that, yeah, the meaning has changed and it goes back and forth. So, yes. Because you're familiar with more than one language and, and so many people aren't, uh, but do you ever uh, watch a, a story or a movie and and have uh, sub the subtitles in a different language than what they're speaking, and then make a note of all the times that the subtitles are just wrong. Yes, um, I I do say Netflix does a really good job, but um, so. 
but there are certain things that you can't translate because we, in the English language, we don't have the like the formal and the informal. We have that in, in the German language. We have that in Korean. In Korean, we actually have the formal, uh, polite, and the informal. So we have like different layers. Um, and I feel that when I watch K-drama, for example, and I watch actually, I, I watch it in, and listen to it in Korean, but then I have sometimes subtitle in German. Mm -hmm. So because there are some legal words that I just don't know. I've never learned it. And watching it, I feel like they could have translated this to the formal because that's what it was in Korean. Why did they not translate it as a formal? Because we have the formal in the Korean language as well as in the uh, German language. And of course, I think, I don't know what they were thinking, actually. But in the English language, of course, you won't have that. Mm -hmm. So there's something lost um, because of the hierarchy and then the different, you know, uh, I guess, societal standing and then the, the closeness. Because you only address someone uh, inform when you either you know close to them or they're inferior or they're lower than you mm -hmm. so that there is this kind of a element certain elements lost uh, and I felt that they should have kept that in the German language is easier to keep than in English because English you don't have it so I can understand that they're not doing it in English but in in the German language I'm like hey you guys could have kept this and um yeah of course I'm, I, I'm trying to analyze like is that the correct way to translate like they convey the meaning mm -hmm. I think that's the most important part and so you, you can't really literally translate anyway but there are certain things of course it's going to get lost in translation because we just don't have words for them mm -hmm. but I feel as long as the the information is conveyed and you have the key points I think that's okay but yes, I, I do certain times, certainly criticize. <laughs> it's like, no, you could, you could have translated. You have all these other choices. But at the same time, Netflix is just pumping out. So depending on the, you know, it's, it's supplying the demand. So of course, you know, if they have a K-drama coming out immediately, the next one is, the ne you know, on the same day, they are broadcasting it to the broader audience. Yes, you're going to have to be a little bit faster. Yeah. And not necessarily that it gets lost, but it's definitely something... I have to say, Disney does a good job. <laughs> Disney is phenomenal. If you, I mean, I don't know if you ever watched Disney's in different languages. I I watch Disney, um, of course, in German because my like, he only watches things in German. But then when students talk about it, I'm like, I don't know that. I have to watch that again in English in order to get the, you know, I'm like, okay, wait. Um, like Frozen is epic. The, when she sings that song, if you ever watch you, YouTube, she was when she sings it in all these different languages, they do a phenomenal job. I have to say, mm -hmm. that's that's they invest some money. They are definitely investing um, their resources and support for the translation and the singing, especially the singing part. Wow. Uh, well, that doesn't surprise me because I know Miyazaki oh, has yeah. uh, said several times that he prefers sometimes the 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 Disney translations to his works more so than what he wrote so yeah. hmm. again uh, you have people like uh neil gaiman doing the trans helping out with the translations too for those type of things so yeah disney has money money you know they end up with better translations because of <laughs> yes they have the money they have the resource they have the support <laughs> uh, yes um and it pays off um, yeah Especially the some of the songs, I'm like, that's a very good translation. And I can't think of the English version. He, it's a, a rather new Disney version. And he says, you're welcome. And he sings that song. I don't know if you guys. Oh. And, uh, in Moana. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And he, you know, he's like, you're welcome. He's kind of sarcastic. Like, yeah, I did all this. You know, I'm the, the, the half god. And he's like, you're welcome. He translated in German for Ghana. I'm like, that's a great translation. But also the singing part. Because, it, you know, you're welcome. There's like, you know, there's like, you know, four parts to this. And then you, you know, for Ghana, it's, it's beautiful. And the way he sings it in German as well as in English, it's, 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 it's done very smoothly, I have to say. Well, I know that, for instance, um, what was it, in Canto, mm -hmm. they actually did the songs, Lynn manuel did the songs such that they could be sung both in English and Spanish equally well. Yeah. He did yeah. He did them basically at the same time in English and Spanish to make sure it, it worked as far as translating. He's, he's insanely talented. 
I'm just going to throw that. I out. still remember it was the weird guy on House MD, so I, I don't know. Okay. Um, do we have anything else that we want to discuss about uh, Grimm or translations before we sort of start wrapping up? I try to emphasize to students that you, you don't translate it word for word. You really translate for the meaning. Mm -hmm. And so there are some things that just say, I don't understand why you can't translate that. It's because you can't. Mm -hmm. We just don't have words for it, or we don't. Um, uh, that was today, for example. There's just a whole notion of I'm going home. You know, I'm going home. There's no preposition in German. You have to have preposition. Mm -hmm. uh, but and then I'm at home. There you have a preposition. So think of like this: those little words, like especially like you know, preposition that you don't even think about that you use. Mm -hmm. um, they having to start thinking about it just because they speak a different language. So just. When you mentioned like, you know, not everyone is kind of like a, you know, a multilingual, I don't realize that, that it's different. I think that's one thing. And I'm trying to, you know, convey this message to the students. Like, it's not really different. It's, just, you know, it's not strange. Like they, 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 their favorite word is like, oh, that's weird. That's strange. Like, no, it's it's not strange. that And that's the thing that you have to understand, too. It's like, for me, it's not strange to say I'm, you know, I need a preposition when I say I'm going home. For you guys, you, it's not strange to say there's no preposition, right? And like, yeah. So it's this kind of a different perspective. Mm -hmm. I think uh, when you, yeah, translation or even just reading different fairy tales, all these different cultural elements, it's really what I like to tell my students. Like, yeah, yeah, it's messing with your head, but it's not. It's it's what we call normal. Normal for you is normal for us or normal for somebody else. Mm -hmm. And just this acceptance and just kind of, yeah, screwing their view up for sure. And putting them in a different perspective. It's a lot of fun. It's it's challenging at mm -hmm. times. But I think um with especially like Grimm's fairy tales and the Disney version, uh I love it because it's so abstract to them. Like, what do you mean they don't they don't live happily ever after? What do you mean they get punished? Or what do you mean, you know, there's somebody dying, there's death. Um, just screwing their view, different perspective. Mm -hmm. That's for me, that's a lot of fun. And they there is some frustration, which is totally acceptable, and I, I, and I, I tell them that too. Like it's, it's, you know, of course you'd be kind of frustrated because it's something different or something new or something weird for you. But after that, you, you know, there's a certain of appreciation. I don't necessarily I want them to accept it for what it is, but just the appreciation that it's just different and it's okay. Yeah. Um, I was going to mention some things that are happening uh, on campus and around the community uh, as we wind down. Uh, Wichita Falls Public Library has story time on Thursday mornings at 1030, and they're going to be hosting another Maker Monday for children from 6 to 11 on April 24th. Uh, the Wichita Theater is making use of both of their stages with productions of The Wizard of Oz and Nonsense 2. Uh, downtown Wichita Falls Development is celebrating 15 years of Cajun fun with Cajun Fest 2023. That's on April 22nd. Uh, MSU's Department of Music will present a jazz band concert uh, in Aiken Auditorium on April 20th and a wind ensemble and orchestra concert on April 27th. The Department of Theater will present William Shakespeare's The Merry Wives of Windsor from April 28th through the 30th. The next After Hours Art Walk will be downtown Wichita Falls on May 4th. And uh, you can and should celebrate free comic book day on Saturday, May 6th. Uh, locally, you can do that at Collector's Den, which is over on Ray Road. Uh, for more information about these events or other things going on in our community, you should check out the events section on the MSU Texas homepage or the calendar uh, at discoverwichitafalls.com slash events. And of course, if you have any comments, questions, or anything for us, you can drop us a line at library at msutexas.edu. I did have something, and I totally forgot about it, because we're talking about different languages and cultures. I'm doing something with the Wichita Falls Museum. It's called Pursuing Knowledge at the Intersection of Language and Culture. Mm -hmm. at Wichita Falls Museum uh, on, what is it called? Uh, WFMA, 
number two Eureka Circle in Wichita Falls. Mm -hmm. And that's on Saturday. And that's done with uh, Dr. Montoya. Uh -huh. She wrote an article about this, kind of kind of like, you know, navigating the multilingualism. And, and it starts at uh, 9.45. We're doing a little workshop where you where students have to um, follow direction in different languages. Oh. Yes, uh, and uh, create something. Um, so they don't get any English instructions. So I have German. So I'm going to give them an instruction in German on how to create something. And then after, and then we have different booths with different languages. Uh, so we have Spanish, we have German, we have Korean, and then three other ones um, that I can't remember right now. But definitely interesting experience. Oh, Hindi. We have Hindi, oh. Farsi, uh, Nepali. Um, so so one, two, three, four, five, six uh, different languages where students particip participate, mm -hmm. listening and uh, doing activities. And then afterwards, I lead the discussion of how did they feel, you know, being a monolingual in this kind of a multilingual space. So how do you nav navigate and what are you some emotions and uh, what do you get out of that? So that's going to be this Saturday, actually, starting at 9.45. But I mentioned that. That sounds awesome. Uh, I've I've heard and, and read that, that 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 is an excellent way to uh, learn a language is to to do something like a, follow a, a, a cooking recipe in the language that you're trying to learn uh, or uh, from the other end of it, if you start uh, writing a da daily diary in the language that you're trying to learn. Uh, and, and at first you'll have simple phrases but as you go along, then it'll become more complex. Uh, but that sounds fascinating. That sounds like a great thing to, to have. Yes, I look forward to it, especially because I'll be doing the German version, which <laughs> of course a lot of students expect um, the Korean perhaps or other languages. And then I'll be leading the discussion as a mono, I guess, as a, in a monolingual space with uh, being a multilingual. Yeah. Okay. But I want to thank you all for having me. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Anything else? <laughs> um, I can't think of anything else. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're going to call that the end of the episode. Uh, thank you for joining us, uh, audience abroad. And uh, we'll be back again next month.